expectation come through the art of defense. Uh, the plan is uh, already my introduction is already given. Uh, we are I'm a founder of a company called NetSquare, uh, which is back in India. Uh, we are doing security consulting services uh, and uh, development services. Uh, what you're going to look at today is uh, we'll start with some of the methodology uh, and a new tricks which we have developed. Uh, attacks on the rise. We'll see some of the attacks. Uh, uh, we'll go with uh, assessment methods for web, web applications. Uh, then we'll use the Metasploit, uh, the framework for exploits uh, for web hacking. Uh, so we'll see some of the tricks over there. Uh, and then we'll see uh, on a defense side, uh, we'll go some of the concepts of uh, using IHTTP module for uh, .NET defense and such. And if we have time, we'll have some question answers. Uh, some eye-opening op eye information. Uh, 95% uh, companies were hacked from web applications uh, and 5% of them are knowing it. Uh, this is a FBI and a CSI uh, review. Uh, most popular attacks are against web server. That's the incident orgs finding. Uh, three out of four websites are vulnerable to attack. Uh, that's uh, Gardner's reports suggesting. 75% uh, hack uh, application level. Uh, that's another Gardner finding. Uh, this one, which I like most, like most, uh, every 1500 line of code has one security breach or security vulnerability. Uh, that is IBM. Uh, 2,000 attacks per week for unprotected website. This is a. Uh, why? Why so many uh, uh, so many attacks to the web applications? The reason is uh, there are so many different technologies associated with it. Uh, mobile application wants to access. Someone wants to access a web application through browser. Uh, intranet data is shared, uh, so employee and others people wants to access the same, the same web application. Uh, this is essentially the purpose of the application is to make it available for 24/7/365, and that's the open window for hackers and attackers as well. So that's why you are seeing a lot of web application related uh, hacks. Uh, which are rising over the last five years. Uh, here is a zone uh, report which is suggesting around 25,000 uh, defacements per month uh, over January 04 to December 04. So you can see uh, this is actually reported uh, defacement. So we are not about the defacement which are not reported. Uh, over 80% attacks, these are the new attacks vulnerability, service vulnerability, web server vulnerability, SQL injections, cookie poisoning, others. So this is a uh, network world finding, which is saying that 80% of attacks, malicious attacks, happens to port 80. Uh, programming errors is, is constituting 64%. So web applications, uh, programming, which is the large part, which is these vulnerability to be get opened up. Uh, misconfiguration and other problems, which is, uh, which is tools like Nikto, Wikto, and um, Whisker and such, which are essentially addressing misconfiguration and other problems. So this is uh, kind of a constitution of uh, vulnerability distribution. Uh, before we get into web application security, we just uh, look at the current posture of uh, infrastructure and host. Uh, this is like a common network diagram where you have a DMZ, you have a web server, you have VPN, mail, database, etc. Uh, router ending at your end. You have a firewall which is sitting in between. Uh, and then you have uh, intranet, which is accessing uh, internet uh, resources using DMZ, and you have a firewall. So firewall is essentially blocking some of the traffic which is pointing to operating system ports or services. It is just allowing the traffic which is uh, attacking web ports, uh, AD or 443 or such. Uh, this is the way a firewall is blocking your services level and operating system level. You can define three levels, uh, operating system level, services level, and on top you are running uh, with your final application level. Operating system level and a services level is uh, pretty much hardened by added defense on account, shared, patches, update, logging, auditing, ports, and registry. So pretty much these two layers are pretty much blocked or pretty much hardened uh, by vendors and such. Uh, at the same time, firewall is not giving you access to uh, services level, operating system level ports. So essentially, you are pretty much blocked there. So uh, you have uh, attacks like a brute force, RPC buffer overflow, null session, etc., would not work uh, 
having introduction of a firewall or hardening uh, the services and operating system. So your next generation attacks which we are seeing right now are like SQL injection, parameter tampering, uh, and such, which is pointing to your application level, which is all time available uh, for attacker and hacker. Uh, so that's the layer which we want to assess. And if you look at the evolution of uh, web application uh, framework, uh, so we can link this web application framework with the security. Uh, 10 years back, there was a simple web servers available which just serve HTML and simple HTML pages where there are no security issues associated with it anyway because they are plain, simple HTML pages going back and forth. But as demands progresses uh, to generate dynamic pages, so if Mr. X is coming, he should be seeing, seeing this part. If Mr. Y comes, it, it's supposed to see this part. At the same time, you don't want a one-way communication. You also want to communicate with, with the server. So you want to send some data to server for registration or for other purposes. So that's where the scripted engine came into picture. Uh, scripted engine is like a technology like ASP, DHTML, PHP, CGI, etc. These technology essentially uh, provide a capacity of uh, dynamically changing type pages and such. Uh, over a period, people have realized that these technology don't scale. These technology where you are unable to scale this technology, so application server frameworks like WebLogic, WebSphere came into picture, which is sitting next to a scripted engine or web server, which is accessing your database. And then uh, middle layer components came into picture, like a, uh, like a COM, DCOM, uh, core by and such, which gives you a ability uh, to bundle around the components. So you have a beans, com, and such, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, already use components which you can use. So new security uh, issues arise out of it. And if you, if you look at the current state, you have the entire host, which is deployed for web application. So you have a ASP.NET host or ASP.NET framework, which runs on 2003, the entire host is deployed for your web application or a J2E framework. So this is a, a framework where you have internet, uh, which where your web client is residing, then you have a DMZ where your web server and scripted web engine is, and then you have a trusted zone, uh, which is running with your application framework and such, and then it is accessing your database, which is maybe internal to corporate or such. So this is a overview of our web, a web security posture. Uh, so essentially what we are looking at is we want to defend our application layer or logic layer around it. We have a host security around it. We have to pro provide network security. And now what you have over here is uh, pretty much host security is, is hardened by platform services and component, runtime services for, and components and operating system. And the network security is uh, where the firewall uh, and router and switches resides. So you have customer, partner, user, prospects coming in. With that, you have a hackers getting in. Uh, so now we'll move to how to assess web application, what kind of a, a web application layer assessment or attacks you can perform. We'll start with the methodology. Uh, there, is a, there is no one methodology of doing it, but you can, you, you can uh, make a methodology for whatever you are doing on a web application layer. So we start with the footprinting, followed by discovery of web, uh, web applications. Then we profile web application. Uh, after finishing a profile, we get a, a real attack points for web application. So we do manual attacks or we perform auto attacks, and then we try to exploit the system, and then based on our finding, we come up with a defense mechanism or controls which we apply to our web application. So this is a fundamental methodology uh, to, doing, uh, to do any web application level assessment. Uh, we start with the footprinting. Uh, there is a, many times I have seen people are doing a web assessment or we, we do a web assessment, we assume that if we have IP address and if we have a port, with these two combination, we can do assessment of a web application, but that's actually a myth. Uh, we'll see why. Uh, what if IP is hosted in a multi-hosted framework? Many times, like, if you go to yahoo.com or games.yahoo.com or uh, groups.yahoo.com or such, these applications, many times I have seen, they are running on a single host. So IP address is the same, but if you change the HTTP protocol with the host, you start accessing a different uh, different application on same IP address. So essentially, one IP can have more application to assess. Objective of footprinting is to find all possible combination of hosts on IP. So that's our objective of footprinting. Uh, finding web application running on domain, uh, how we can do that. Uh, there are two new approaches which, have, uh, which are evolved or developed. Uh, I have posted two papers on each one of them uh, on my website. Uh, one is a host footprinting, another is a domain footprinting. Uh, 
both, both, both of these methodology are focused on web applications. So we want to determine uh, the, the scope of a web application. That's the precise reason why uh, these two methodologies are defined. Uh, so let's look at the example. For example, this is a this is a, uh, a, a httpd.conf uh, file for Apache where you have a three hosts defined. One is a one is a running on a port 80, which is a document root, which is a I would say a default host. So when you hit IP address, whatever page is going to be served by this particular host is a is a first block, and then. This particular host is running with two different web applications. One is a www.blue.com and another is a www.rate.com. So virtually two hosts are created which are having completely two different separate web applications. One is running on a user local Apache 2 HT docs blue, another is running on a red. So a scope of these assignment of a scope of these IP assessment is to assess these three applications or uh, uh, assessing the red and blue, these two applications. So how, if you don't have access to a uh, HTTPD conf, then how we are going to determine that, uh, how many web application it is running with. So the objective of footprinting is to find this particular information. Uh, if we go for a default access over here, we just connect, we open a TCP connection uh, to port 80 and make a head request. You can see we get a content length of 1456. That's, we have, we have hit the default application. Now, if I, send the same request with host is a www.blue.com. So I'm sending HTTP protocol with a host tag. Then I'm getting a content length of which is a completely new web application I'm assessing or I'm getting response from. And if I go for host www.red.com, then I'm going to get a content length of nine, which is a completely third different web application. So this is the way we can identify it is running with blue, red or uh, red.com. But how to find these names, www.blue.com or www.red.com, that's the objective. Uh, so how to find host? Who is record? Uh, this may help. Uh, who is record can help that. Uh, there is, uh, on a DNS, you can get a PTR entry. You can get a PTR record. Uh, if not, that's a bad luck. Uh, there are a few interesting who is services which we are going to look at, uh, which have a database which is linked to a host uh, and, a, and a names. So we'll, we'll see that. Uh, that is essentially uh, key for us. And then, uh, so let's see that now. So what you have over here is a simple who is record for IP addresses, for example, 20388128.10, uh, for which uh, we are looking at uh, what uh, multi hosts are on this particular application, so on, on this particular IP. So we want to assess how many IP application this particular IP is running with. Uh, we got a name server from who is record, that is ns1xyz.com. Uh, so what we do next is we connect to the, uh, uh, the particular server using a utility called NS Lookup. That's pretty straightforward. We set up a server ns1xyz.com as uh, as a default query server, and then we apply 20388128.10, and we get a, a resolved name back, which is suggesting www.blue.com. But that's the top top of the list. That's the first or one only uh, host which will get disclosed. So what I'm doing next is I'm setting up a type that is a PTR. So I want to access a PTR record from NS Lookup. If administrator has created a PTR record which is suggesting uh, how many web applications or how many hosts which are configured on this particular IP address. So I get that. Now in that, you can see the IP address, I get uh, both their names, www.blue.com and www.red.com. So this is the one way we can identify. But what if Uh, what if uh, oh, uh, what if you have a PTR record is not there? So as you can see, there you get a non-authoritative answer where the PTR record is not there essentially. So then you are stuck uh, because you don't have a PTR record. You don't know how many application it is running with. So next step is uh, to go uh, uh, a server uh, who is service called who is dot webhosting dot info and slash IP address. They have a complete data linked or linked with uh, host names which are registered in a registry. So then you can get a list of all IP addresses, all, all hosts which are configured on this particular IP address. For example, 20388128.11 has 15 virtual application running on the box. So essentially, if either one of these application is vulnerable, essentially all application can be vulnerable depending on what, what kind of a vulnerability you are accessing. So then you have, a, uh, you have all, all information which is required. 
so so almost we we got all possible host on any single IP address. Now assessment is possible using host stack. So I can do assessment sending a right host stack, and then I can fetch information which I for. Uh, we can access all application and server. Uh, we'll serve right information both on HTTP 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, now we'll move to do domain footprinting. This is very interesting exercise. Uh, and I think a success of domain footprinting is, is becoming very higher. Uh, we'll see why. Uh, domain footprinting methods are a uh, new way of getting information. Here we are going to leverage Google or A9 kind of uh, search engines. Uh, we can uh, fetch uh, information of a cross domain uh, information as well. And we can create a domain map uh, using this method. Uh, so I have a small tool written uh, called WS Pawn, uh, which can perform this kind of exercise. What I'm doing over here is uh, I'm sending, if you, if you know in a Google, you have a different directives. So site is one of them, site colon, then you give a either application name or a domain name, it will give you uh, which are uh, the, the web application running with a, with a domain which is ending with that. So for example, here is a, is a large portal of uh, back, in, uh, back in India called sifi.com, for example. So what I'm doing is I'm giving a sifi.com and based on that, what the list of domains it's going to give me back. Over here you can see the entire list of domains. So I'm getting a blogs.sifi.com, login.sifi.com, food.sifi.com, tamil.sifi.com and such. This is a completely zero level knowledge we are getting. Only a client has supplied us or assessment which we want to perform is just the sifi.com. That's the only information which I'm having. And I want to gather all application which is belongs to or running for this particular uh, client. Uh, so what I got is a complete list of all particular host which are ending with sifi.com. Now each of these is essentially a web application, a live web application we are having. So next step is uh, we just get a list of it and then what I'm doing over here is I'm using a second directive which is called a link directive on Google. So you can give a link colon www.yahoo.com or www.sifi.com. What link directive is doing is it will put uh, www.sifi.com in a center and whatever applications which are pointing to a sifi.com uh, in, a, in a database will give a list, a uh, complete list of that. So uh, usually what will happen is the, these all applications which are running are interlinked. So for example, sifi.com is a, is, a, is a domain or a sifi.com and many different, so then I start list of all the hosts which are pointing to that particular domain. So what I will do over here is I will take each one of them I will take blogs.sifi.com, login.sifi.com, food.sifi.com, and another, and try to fetch the complete list. Excuse me, complete list of uh, uh, do, uh, uh, domains or of applications which are pointing to sifi.com. So I will. Then uh, in the third step, what I do is uh, it is very easy to find a sifi.com IP range or a net block. So I, I get a net block over here, and once I have a net block, I will compare this net block. Uh, uh, the information which is gathered by a uh, link directive. So uh, you can see over here, for example, www.ctar.com, which IP address is 202.144.67, which is in this particular range. So now I know that the, this particular application, which is multi-hosted, or this particular ad domain name, which is which I ever have, have never found on anywhere, is actually running on this particular IP range. There, that that's, that's, uh, decides that these sifi.com or it's falling in the sifi.com domain. So it will become a part of my assessment. This is the way pretty much you can find uh, the complete set. Uh, you can find the complete set of um, IP addresses associated with the host names and such. Uh, so, and, and the complete focus of this exercise is application. So whatever Google finds uh, from a Google's uh, crawler engine is essentially a web application. It's going to go and crawl web application. It's not going to crawl any other port. So that's the precise information we are also looking for. So synergy is right there. Uh, it really worked well um, uh, in the field. I have used this method and uh, public domain are simply excellent way to fetch information. Uh, pretty much Google can help in fetching this information. Uh, next step is very easy. 15 app, 15 host uh, name. Then the next step is we just have to discover. You have to make sure that all these 15 applications are live and separate applications, and not the pointing to the same application uh, which are still hanging around. 
So the, that step is called discovery, where we are looking for a live applications. Uh, so objective is to find live host which serve other than a default content. So one IP can uh, all uh, can a list of all li uh, live uh, applications on IP addresses. Uh, we can use method to do so. So for example, I'm uh, raw, I'm uh, making a, a netcat connection or a TCP connection to 120.11, and I'm sending a simple head request response which I'm getting. Now I will send a host with a junk uh, as a as a name. This is actually in a host which is not actually multi-hosted on this particular domain or in this particular IP address. So what I get is a 404. I know that if host is not there, then this is a particular response I should be getting. So I will give host icenet.net. You can see I got a 200 OK with a different e-tag. And then Adani 200 OK. If any, any domain name or any, any application uh, name which is giving me this particular re response is actually a dead, I, a dead host or a, a dead web app. This is the way I harvest all live applications. So I have a discovery phase. At the end of discovery phase, I got all possible live. Now uh, we have a combination of IP port and host. The host, which was a missing information before footprinting, we may have IP address and a port, but with IP address and port, we are not going to do much. What if there is no default application? Uh, get a get a default page, and then you say like, oh, this this particular page, uh, this particular IP uh, has no live application. You end end your scope there. But once you have the different ball game altogether. Uh, Above 3 can help in getting right information out. Application review is now possible and scope would be complete for any specific IP address. So our objective audit on a web application is to first step is to with a zero knowledge we have to harvest combination of host because all possible combination of host will, will give you access to live application which are running what you are assessing for. Uh, the next step once you are done with a uh, with uh, your methods and uh, discovery method next step is going to a profiling uh, what is very important task many times I have seen uh, people doing web they will just look at the, the URL and try to tweak the URL uh, feel some some junk data in a form and try to post it like on the on on, on the on immediately they start attacking but that's not the actual way to do it. Uh, the, the important method is to profile web application. Uh, objective is to find from where uh, we get cookie, where the forms are. So there is a large web application. Uh, for example, a web application is having almost 200 pages. Now let's take an example. Then where the cookies are, where the forms are, uh, whether the application has applet or object on it or such, uh, where the query strings are and such. So this is a very critical situation. What you can do is you can use certain regex pattern and run these regex pattern on ML code which you are getting, and from that you can uh, you can get this information. Uh, so here is a small later on. Uh, what you can do is, uh, for example, I have a, a small web application, a sample web application, uh, and I want to do assessment. The typical uh, web store where you can place order and go to checkout and view cart and such. What I'm doing here is to profile this particular web application, uh, I will call HTTP knife. So it is a typical proxy. I will uh, make sure that traffic goes through my proxy. So I start this proxy on 480. With flight, it will scrub HTML and give me information which I'm looking for. on now I will set up a connection setting I will go for local host port 8000 here is my proxy so now I will start traversing the application I can do a view card and such now if I go over here while traversing it has the first request which I have sent was a catalog.asp http 1.0 Click here. You can see this is a particular request which was sent from my uh, browser. Uh, this is essentially, and then here is a is a complete profile. You this particular page which I have received has three forms, three hidden tags. Okay. 
you have a form. Form has hidden tag which you can manipulate. It has uh, no login page. Uh, it has a one script, JavaScript, which is running on a page. Uh, it has a one function. Take no email addresses, no comment. If there are 13 comments, then you can see what the form is, what the what script is, uh, the entire comment, juicy information about the application. And then you can go over here and see the actual code uh, on the page and such. So this is essentially a profiling. This profiling can be done in many ways. Uh, either you can use a wget, use a wget, uh, mirror your application uh, on a local machine, run some Perl script, and you will get the complete profile. What we have is we know of every places where uh, critical information is residing. So, for example, if we here at uh, main page, form login. So now we know that this particular place where there is a kind of a form. Uh, which is asking for login information. So I can do a brute forcing or whatever attacks I want to perform. But I got all of my profile. I got a, I got all possible attack points. So before just jumping to the attack, this is a very effective to map your entire web application. So once your uh, mapping is over, Uh, so this is the way your mapping is over. You have a complete map of your web application profile. You know what resources, you list of URLs, and you have a new list of con uh, attributes, uh, form, command, email, applet, object, cookie, or simply mark where, uh, what is lying. So this is your uh, call, which is a very important step of a methodology uh, while you are performing uh, web application assessment. Uh, again, you can do use a Google with a site tag. Or you can you can add a fetch with using in URL and a file type uh, at the web slash star whatever host you are looking for you get all cache pages so even you don't have to bother to crawl application all cache pages are are there uh, and pretty much you can uh, you can profile your application this way uh, so what I have over here is a small application uh, uh, since there is no internet connection what I'll do is I'll just run uh, so here is a tool which I, I'm using, I'm going to, again this is going to be released. Uh, I'm entering www.icenet.net which I want to profile. I do a get it. So it will go and fetch all information about it from a Google, whatever URLs it is having and such. So now I have a list of URLs. All these URLs which are belongs to a host called or application called www.icenet.net. If I click anyone, go and get, grab a cache for me. So now it is going to a Google and getting a uh, fetching a cache for me uh, once i have a cache you can see the uh, i got a here over here i got an entire profile for web application so till this step we haven't hit actual web application we all we have done is completely passive work we have gathered information we have gathered site we have gathered what what application is running with we have profiled them everything so all can be done without actually touching upon a site uh, once we are done with this, uh, what is web application attributes? Web application attributes uh, are of many types, like a query string, forms, JavaScript, etc. Each identifier attribute can have vulnerability and very important for developer to. Uh, so, if we are performing assessment, uh, we should be knowing each of these attributes very well and what can have, what can go wrong if there is a vulnerability in each of them. Uh, vulnerability can be exploited by an attacker. Uh, forms and a query strings are major source of exploitation. Uh, other parameters like cookie, script, uh, client side, path include CGI bin, servlet, etc. Expose business level information risk. So this is uh, about attribute. Now we will look at the security threats for each one of these attributes. Uh, why vulnerable? Uh, poor web application coding, insecure deployment of web application, uh, either on a .NET or any 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 other platform. Uh, insufficient input validation, uh, no monitoring on web application traffic, no IDS, uh, no web traffic filtering, uh, and web application attributes are not guarded well. So web uh, attributes are, for example, your query string, which is taking input, is not guarded well, then they, it, it become a potential source of vulnerability. So next step is, now we know where forms, comments, emails, applet, object, cookie, auth are, are there. And then we have a complete list of uh, attacks which can be performed from input validation, authorization, parameter tampering, 
authentication, SQL manipulation, client side manipulation, remote command execution and such. So now we know like if there is a form, these many attacks can be performed. If there is a query string, one can perform this many attacks. So now our assessment vehicle will become a thorough. We step by step produce, uh, test each of these controls. We'll step by step uh, we'll look for any vulnerability which are associated with this attack. Uh, so if we look at our application over here, uh, for example, if I go to a catalog, uh, I know this catalog has a form from my my uh, my profile or looking at it, and I go for a minus one. That's a typical attack. Uh, it has a value which say that it's going to be quite vulnerable. If if someone can do a menu, uh, financial transaction, well, it put a minus value to the to the quantity. Then what? It's going to be uh, come on a credit card. Uh, credit card company is going to pay him or what? So this is. Uh, one type of attack, then a catalog, you go over here, you can see ID field over here, so pretty much query string is right there. So you go and go for a single quote, which is uh, breaking SQL query kind of thing, and immediately you can find that there is SQL command, my command, or some kind of uh, error you get. Based on that, you can decide that this particular file is, uh, this particular resource is vulnerable to. If I go to a rebates page, I click this, below I can see, uh, that it is asking for LOC, uh, backham.html. So over here, essentially this is the way. So instead of that, I go to .aspx. What I'm doing is I'm trying to fetch the source code of this particular file. So then I get a complete source code of the file. And this is the way I can start traversing into the application and such. Uh, if I go to the authentication, then I can do a cookie analysis since this particular page is giving me a cookie and I can do a cookie manipulation and such. So this is the way once we have a profiled application, we can go ahead and start uh, looking for different attacks. We can go ahead and start uh, what kind of a different attacks can be performed. Uh, there are a lot of literature out there for about the attacks and such. We'll see two new kind of attacks which are uh, which can be exploited and uh, quite a new uh, in the field. One is something called XPath injection. Uh, XPath parsing, uh, you know, nowadays everything is converted into XML format, so uh, what developers are doing it is they convert every data into XML format and then run a XPath commands or XPath queries. XPath queries is like a SQL queries, uh, so essentially you can, you can run any XPath query on XML document and then uh, you can specify which node you are looking for, which combination of nodes you are looking for, what is your parent node and what is your child node and such. Uh, so even MS SQL Server provides interface and one can get table in XML format. Uh, once this information is fetched, one can run XPath queries and such. Uh, the SQL statements X star from users for XML auto. This la last two directive is saying uh, that give me information in XML format. This information may be coming from a database excuse me, or application to application talk is going on. Uh, so then I'm taking entire uh, entire information in XML format and then you can see the orange line which is saying a string credential equal to user use, where username is equal to uh, uh, plus user that is the information coming from application and password. So this is like a SQL query which is going on and if it works you find uh, any any username password combination in your XML document then a count XML count would be zero greater than zero so you will go in a true loop else you will go in a false loop. So true loop is essentially where you are authenticated and a false uh, will be unauthenticated. Uh, here is a, where you, one can perform XPath injection, that is a string credential equal to uh, this particular line. Uh, one can do XPath injection. XPath parsing can be leveraged like we used to do one or one equal to one in SQL injection. Uh, similar string is like this. Uh, single quote or one equal to one or single quote, single quote equal to single quote. This essentially, these two ors will break all uh, left hand side and right hand side query and one equal to one which is going to be remain, which is always true. So what happens over here is that this will always true on the first node and get, a, get access to a first username password combination. So if you have a, your table has a say 100 username password and uh, you, you do a parsing in this manner, then what you're going to happen is if this XPath query get executed, then you automatically become uh, first user, first username password. Uh, so then you can access uh, entire application using that username and password. So for example, if we do, here is a, uh, I'm entering username and password and logging into system. 
Uh, so user, uh, this particular um, each username and password works, I can log in and I can do everything on it. Uh, I'm logging out, I'm trying uh, the expat work, so or not. What I'm going to do over here is support file. This is a pattern which I want to execute. So over here I put this in a, in a username field and log in. So I become a Sriraj, that's the 10,001 10, user. So immediately, whoever is the first user, I become that. I, I don't know username, I don't know password. But since uh, this query or this XML uh, uh, authentication going on X path, essentially I can break or I can bypass the entire authentication and straight away uh, become a first username and password combination. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, on XPath injection. Uh, next we'll see the uh, remote command execution uh, from SQL. Uh, what if SQL injection works, what you can do. Uh, it is a myth one can get admin root access from application layer, it's quite possible. Uh, it is all about one way hacking. Uh, you can get a command prompt uh, from that. Uh, SQL execution from web, uh, then you can do a privilege escalation and owning the system, we'll see that, how we can do that. Uh, what if, many times we have seen on the field where uh, you, you can identify a spot where SQL injection is possible, but you don't know web root, so you can't execute a command, uh, create a file and put it in a web root so then you can see the file. Uh, or firewall is not giving outbound traffic. So you have SQL injection possibility, you, have, you may have XP command shell running on the server, but you can't throw a connection back because firewall is blocking the connection which is coming back uh, outbound traffic to uh, through internet, so you are blocked there as well. If you know a web route, it is not provided to get a right access on a web route. So then, uh, essentially that will be XP command shell, which is a completely blind XP command shell we are looking at. So the first step is to identify whether my SQL injection point is working with her SA privileges or not. If you have SA privileges on a, on a backend MS SQL server, then uh, essentially you can, you can perform a next step. So what I'm doing over here is, uh, First I will go over here where I have a SQL injection point. This is my SQL injection point. If I do plus and plus one equal to one, then this page I'm getting, this is one or one is always true. And if I do one equal to zero, which is always false, then this is a page I'm going to get. So now instead of this query, which is uh, appended with and, I'm trying to inject this particular query uh, this is over here. Here is a select query. What I'm doing is I'm taking a login name and from a login name I'm taking a first character of a login, which is, for example, if it is running with SA, then S is a first character. I'm comparing it with a 115. I, I'm converting it to S key and then comparing it to 115. So if I do so, a query uh, and the append part I add this I do a 115 if it is get compared so it is a 1 equal to 1 then I will get this particular page so now I know that s uh, s key value is 115 if I go for 114 then essentially I'm going this page so now I know that what is the correct value and which is the incorrect value, I can brute force and try to identify what privileges it is running with. So now I got a 115, I got a first character which is S. Now I go for a second character and compare it with say 97. So it is A, 97. So I got that as well. If I compare with a B, that's a 98, then it is going to give me a wrong page. So this is the way I can brute force and fetch out the information on SQL that which back I can start exploiting this particular system. Uh, here is a small exploit which I have written which works with a, with a completely blind command shell. Here are a few line of code which I want to echo into the system. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, taking a W script object. Uh, I'm echoing cmd.exe. So I'm using XP command shell and try to echo uh, particular these these five or six lines what this five or six line is going to do is once the script get executed successfully then it is going to create a da dash secret folder 
that's a virtual folder on a web server. It will map this folder to WinND system32 directory uh, and give me uh, executive privileges on, on, the, on, the, on that particular route. So essentially, since I'm not getting in, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out uh, the entire WinND system32 folder. So that's what this is going to do. And then I will echo it. What I've done over here is I've used, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a attack framework called Metasploit. So what I'm doing is I've created a module for uh, SQL injection using Metasploit, which looks something like this, where very simply I'm not doing much, but I'm just echoing these many commands as my payload onto the server. I'm creating a secret.vbs file on the server and once this file is uh, uh, generated, I just execute that particular file. So for example, if we go for a Metasploit, uh, here is Metasploit, it has a both uh, console base or a web base. We try with a web base, uh, we'll go for a console base. Oh, it's a web base, we'll go for a web base. So I'll open a, another tab over here and another tab. This is going to create a virtual route on IP address. So then we, we can access essentially information with IP address. So my 192.168.7.50 is my application IP address, which is also www.dvds4less.net. If I look for a secret, there is actually no secret at this point. Now, if I go over here and take 127.555 listener, I start it over here. So this is a, the Metasploit exploits are out there. Uh, I have put my exploit over here in a framework. So that's the SQL injection exploit. Now I just have to pass on my IP address. That is 192.168.7.50. I have to pass R path. This R path is essentially a vulnerable area which we want to pass. So this is a vulnerable URL. So I am a virtual host. So I do www.dvds4 less.net. So this is essentially a virtual host and now I will exploit the system. So, oops, I forgot a dot in between. So here's a dot. Oh, 192.168.7.50 and I will exploit the system. So this is a payloads are, uh, are all file is echoed on the server and then uh, if it is successfully exploited on a blind uh, blind XP command shell, then I'm testing with just running a secret cmd.exe C setup. So I have a set command executed on the server. And if I go over here and go for a Oops. Over here, you can see the entire Windows system 32 directory is out. So now Essentially from here, I am very easily cmd.exe and set command, dir command, whatever command you want to execute, you start executing this command. So this is a way uh, one can start exploiting the system uh, in the next step. So this is all about exploiting the system. And similarly, you can do using a Metasploit, uh, the command line interface. So this is all about attacks. Uh, what different kind of attacks we, we can perform on the system. We have seen few uh, exploit, uh, new exploitation methods as well. Now we'll see some of the defense techniques uh, on a .NET platform. Uh, what is new in a .NET platform? Web application has separate scope and HTTP pipeline can be accessed. Uh, it's like a old ISAP. Uh, it's a new, newly converted into uh, modules called HTTP module and HTTP handler, which we can, def uh, we can use in defending gates. And we can build uh, firewall as well as IDS using these modules. Uh, so here, firewall you're running with IaaS and such. What you can do is you can add a layer of defense for a web application firewall or a web application IDS, which is sitting right next to your IaaS web server. Uh, then in a .NET web application implementing HTTP module, what you have is a complete trace or you have a complete stack where you have a web application client which will send a request. It will go to IaaS, it will go to ASP, uh, ASP.NET underscore ASAP dot DLL, it will go to HTTP application. At this point, what you can do is you can fetch this traffic or whatever is hitting to your uh, application layer, you can access this using HTTP module, and then you can pass it to, uh, you can validate over there as a firewall or ADS and let it pass below. So then you want to defend your web application resource. Uh, you can fetch this information out uh, with a module, create its contacts, and uh, get the 
handler to HTTP request and HTTP response. Uh, so leveraging HTTP module and handler can be leveraged. Application layer firewall can be equipped up on the, on the fly. Few line of code, you can create your own uh, firewall and uh, your own uh, input validation defense. Uh, so here is a is a IHTP module. I will just plug in IHTP module between IHTP application and my actual resource and guard my def uh, my resource. Uh, here is a very simple few line of code where I am uh, extending my web firewall using IHTP module. Compare regex patterns. Uh, you can create an instance uh, and get a, a handler to HTTP stack. Uh, there is a complete paper out there uh, on this particular topic on my website, so you can uh, go through this paper and, uh, and very string. And then product ID is zero equal to one quantity and such. That is a part of actual post request. Uh, so then uh, we are getting a handler to application. Uh, uh, oops, sorry. Got this, we got regression resource, and similarly, I'm just taking a post request, creating a ASCII buffer for it, and comparing it uh, with uh, my regular expression pattern. If I found a post, any malicious character in a post, I will throw security error straight out. And here is a particular uh, request will never hit to my application layer. So that's uh, that's the way I can configure my rule set. Uh, once it is in place, what I would do is I just have to add these three lines. Uh, and load that particular module into my application defense. And once I have done this, then I can block these kind of a traffic with a security error. So we'll see uh, that. So if you go over here, and in a store view code, I actually hit my resource, which is uh, residing in my application. So over here, I'm, what I'm doing is, this is an old web application configuration file. This is the original config file. And this is my current config file. This config file is essentially going to load uh, this HTTP module for defense. So this is a line which is going to load HTTP module uh, into my web application context. So now if I perform a similar attack, it is going to give me a security error. So this is the way you can essentially get a ha handle on your traffic which is hitting to your web application and completely secure your web application. Uh, uh, even though your developer is left behind uh, anything or your developer has uh, poor input validation, you can guard your input validation over here. Uh, once you have that in place, uh, what other defense strategies you can do? All security attribute, attributes can be guarded in one way or other using firewall or IDS. Uh, some of the deployment parameters can be implemented using this method. Uh, you can even create IHTP handler, which is like IHTP module. Some interesting more defense tricks is a session management. You can enhance your session management using the, these kind of a modules, which give you actual handle to a session. ISAP, the old technology, which was not used to give a handler to a session, this particular module will give you a handler to a session. So you can use that. Uh, you can provide an application level brute forcing if any any particular session or IP address has tried more than three times or four times uh, using username password combination, you can just throw him out. Uh, you can send honey traps from IHTP modules, so you can create a small uh, bitmap image of a zero by zero size and put it to xyz.com. So only automated tool will recognize this pattern. If you are uh, using, uh, if you are browsing the site, you are never going to find that zero bit pattern somewhere in a long page and click, go there and click there. Only automated tools or crawlers which are going to go there, parse href, and make a, this particular request. So then you can set up a honey trap. This honey trap, if you get a request for this particular, uh, and what you can do is put that uh, client in a loop for 10 or 15 times uh, asking a different href which, are, uh, which actually don't exist on a server. So this is the way you can stop automated attacks. And then you can do a advanced uh, things where you can identify browser catching. You can you can figure out whether this is hitting to your web application and completely secure your web application. Uh, uh, even though your developer is left behind uh, anything or your developer has uh, poor input validation, you can guard your input validation over here. Uh, once you have that in place, uh, what other defense strategies you can do? All security attribute, attributes can be guarded in one way or other using firewall or IDS. Uh, some of the deployment parameters can be implemented using this method. Uh, you can even create IHTP handler, which is like IHTP module. 
Some interesting more defense tricks is a session management. You can enhance your session management using the, these kind of a modules which give you actual handle to a session. ISAP, the old technology which was not used to give a handler to a session, this particular module will give you a handler to a session. So you can use that. Uh, you can provide an application level brute forcing if any, any particular session or IP address has tried more than three times or four times uh, using username password combination, you can just throw him out. Uh, you can send honey traps from IHTB module, so you can create a small uh, bitmap image of a zero by zero size and put it to xyz.com. So only automated tool will recognize this pattern. If you are uh, using, uh, if you are browsing the site, you are never going to find that zero bit pattern somewhere in a long page and click, go there and click there. Only automated tools or crawlers which are going to go there, parse href and make up this particular request. So then you can set up a honey trap. This honey trap, if you get a request for these particular, uh, and what you can do is put that uh, client in a loop for 10 or 15 times uh, asking a different HRS which, are, uh, which actually don't exist on a server. So this is the way you can stop automated attacks. And then you can do a advanced uh, things where you can identify browser catching. You can, you can figure out whether this actual request is came from a browser or not. Because what you can do is you can send a, once you have a first HTTP request, you can force HTTP module to send one or two requests, which will again force requests or a browser to generate uh, certain responses. If browser is not, instead of a browser is someone using a TCP uh, client or someone is using automated client, which is not going to generate uh, exact fingerprinting like a browser. So you can identify uh, what actual browser is, and then once you have a browser catching in place, uh, you can you can, you are sure that this particular application is actually accessed by browse actually accessed by live browser and not automated tools and such. So that's pretty much uh, about defense. So that's uh, thank you very much for listening patiently. And if you have a question, I'm open for that. Let's start turn on the lights. Go ahead, questions. Okay, thank you very much.